don't know how to start this teaching. Don't know how to get into it. This is one of the most important teachings I've ever given. Not my research, not my revelation. Uh, mostly the things I teach are just real revelations to me that God just shows me. But this, I cannot take the credit for. Back in 1984, I was listening to a tape, tape a tape in a tape recorder uh, of Joe, Joe Good, and he was teaching about <coughs> the tabernacle. And he, he was saying things, simple things like, if I, he was adopted into the Kiowa tribe. And he said, if I told you to make a taipego sash, sash, you wouldn't know how because you've never seen one. You've never been told like how to do the stitching and what goes into it and all that jazz. And the same is true for the tabernacle. If you just have words, you don't know what it looks like. And then he said, and so everything in the tabernacle was shown to Mo Moses in, in a pattern, in a blueprint, in a picture. And I... And, he, you know, through his accent like this, I had to you know, rewind it three times to make sure I was hearing what I heard. Because I'd never been told that, never been shown that. Never saw it in the Bible, obviously, on my own. And I was like, what? That started me in 1984. That is what changed my whole life. That dumb little tape on a tape recorder of Joe Good saying that one phrase... Everything in the tabernacle was a picture of heaven. A picture, a shadow, he said. What? If everything in the tabernacle is a picture, that means everything in Judaism is a picture. And then I was like, oh, I better pull the reins in on that one. I mean, I can't like a big, big, big statement like that to myself. Don't go there. So, well, maybe, who knows? So I said, I'm going to check it and find out. And that's what started me learning pictures. That was the greatest revelation of my life. My whole life is about Tavniot. My whole life, everything about it, God called me to teach Tavniot. And then I quickly found out that nobody else is teaching it. And I, you know, got shoved under the bus. And that was the end of that. But I kept going since then, since 1984. That was the greatest revelation of my life. This, today, is on par with that. That's all I can say. This, this, this is life changing. It's bizarre. It's, it's amazing. It's huge, huge, huge. And it's this. Jews, and we were raised with this, Jews are terrified to say, Yehovah for a number of reasons I'll talk about. But his name is Yehovah, and it's simple. And I'm gonna show you how we know this. And I'm gonna prove it to you how we know this, and then you can go do the research on your own with the gentleman who this is his life calling, which I'll talk about. So the name of the Torah portion is Who Should I Say? And the reason I'm calling that is because that's what the Jews said to Moshe. Moshe said it to God. God says, okay, this is my name. My name is this, whatever it is. And then Moshe goes, okay, well, wait a minute. What if they don't, what if, who should I say is calling? Who should I say, you know, who should I say is saying all this stuff to me to go bring the Jews out? And then God says, who? So the Torah portion is uh, Exodus 6. God spoke to Moshe and he said to him, I am yod heh vav -Hey, Yahavah. And that's all anybody knows. Yahavah, supposedly. It's what I was taught. It's what everybody's taught. It's what world over everybody believes. That the Jews do not know how to pronounce God's name. And we're all told this from the time we're little kids. I appeared to Avraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov with El Shaddai. But by my name, Yehovah, or yod heh vav -Hey, whatever it is, I did not become known to them. However, yod heh vav -Hey is said between God and Abraham, between God and Isaac, between God and Jacob, 
more than 42 times. But he says, I didn't show up with that name. Absolutely untrue. So it's got to mean something else. I did not become known to them with that. And also I established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their sojournings. I heard the moans of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians are holding in bondage, and I remembered my covenant. So, say to the children of Israel, I am yod heh vav -Heh, and for now I'm just going to say yod heh vav -Heh, and I will take you out from under the burdens of Egypt, and I'll redeem you with an outstretched arm and great judgments, and I will take you to me as a people, and I will be your God, but you're not going to know my name. Doesn't that seem stupid? I'm going to take you to me. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to do all this for you, Israel. I'm going to take you to myself like a little baby, but you're not going to know my name. But basically, that's the construct that we have. God wants you to know him so close, but you can't know his name. You can't call him by his name. You can know everything about him except the most basic thing, his name. That is the construct we have, and I don't care who you are. Jew, Gentile, Christian, Orthodox, Hasidic, it doesn't matter. Everybody believes this. And he says, I will be a God to you, and you will know that I am yod heh vav -Heh, your God. But then you can't know it. Seems weird, doesn't it? Seems like, come here, baby, come here. Come here, I love you so much. Get away from me. It's, it's really rude, this construct that has been created. It's not right. And we've all given into it. We've all believed it our whole life. I'm going to show you why. Who has brought you out, I will bring you into the land concerning which I raised my hand. That means like made an oath. I raised my hand to give to Abraham, to Yitzhak, to Yaakov. I am the unpronounceable, whatever it is. Moshe told this to the children of Israel, but they didn't listen to Moshe because they're under bondage and they can't breathe and they're you know, distressed and the hard labor has gotten to them and they can't, they can't hear him. They can't hear him. So, yod heh vav -Heh spoke to Moshe saying, come, speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he'll send, he will send the children of Israel out. But Moshe spoke before yod heh vav -Heh, saying, Behold, the children of Israel didn't listen to me. How's Paro going to listen to me? It's just not going to happen. Seeing that I am of uncircumcised lips, I talk like I have closed lips, like I, like I don't know what I'm talking about. So the Lord spoke to Moshe and to Aharon, and he set up for them. He established for them concerning both the children of Israel and concerning Pharaoh. In other words, look, I'm telling you to do this, and here's how you're going to do it. Now go do it. To let the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So we got a huge problem here. It says, I am whatever. I appear to Abraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov with El Shaddai, but by my name Yehovah or yod heh vav -Heh, I didn't become known to them. And yet that name is tossed back and forth between Abraham and Isaac and Jacob with God, over and over and over and over again. So then how can you say that you didn't show up with that name? God makes no sense. So Rashi, in his incredible wisdom and down-to-earth um, grammarian outlook, he just looks at the words, he's so smart. He was so smart. He says this. Wait, before I get to this. Last week, last week I shattered one of the biggest myths that is out there. But we had to go through it very, very systematically. I've never done that before. And the, the myth is that there's 10 lost tribes. There is not 10 lost tribes. Never was, never will be. And the myth that the Gentiles who are called to God, they feel that calling in them. They're not Israel. They are called in the New Testament Gentiles. They're just joining with Israel to do Judaism so they can know God. But they're still called Gentiles. Simple. But that's huge. 
And it's hard for some reason. It is hard. So that was a huge myth we tackled, that I tackled last week. This is even bigger. This is even bigger. This is the myth that the Jews didn't know how to say the name of God and didn't write the name of God. It's a huge, huge myth. And you know why it exists? Because nobody ever checked the Jewish sources. It's that simple. So, Rashi, in his great wisdom, looks at this gigantic subject of, well, God, what do you mean you didn't say yod Hey vav Hey to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob? So this is what he says. A certain man, I'm sorry, this is, this is about last week, uh, about that, that man who, uh, who said, he said, dunu uh, dini, judge me like I judge. And so they checked out his genealogy magically because all the, the, the genealogies were burnt up in the temple. So that's what the myth is. That's what the lie is. So they checked his genealogies after the temple was destroyed, long after, and they found he's from the tribe of Dan, who were supposed to be non-existent anymore. And then they tell another story about a guy who loves the seashore and all the things by the seashore. And he, they say they checked his genealogy. How is that possible? This is way after the temple was destroyed. And they found, hey, this guy's from Zebulun, who is not supposed to exist anymore. It's supposed to be lost. All right, so that's why that's here. This is about myth shattering. And now we come to this myth that the Jews never said the sacred name of God and no one knows how to pronounce it. Well, this is why Rashi comes along and he says, God said, well, he said to him, I am, I'm going to put Yehovah here. You don't have to believe me yet. I am Yehovah, meaning I'm faithful to recompense, to pay back all those who walk before me. That's what that word yod he vav he is about. He's going to repeat it several times. I didn't send you to Paro except to fulfill my words, which I spoke way, way, way long time ago to the fathers. I am yod he vav he. I am Yehovah. Meaning, I'm faithful to bring retribution. When stated in conjunction, like, like Yehovah or yod he vav he, when that is linked or cemented to um, an act warranting punishment, then it's about being faithful to give out the punishment. E.g., or that is, or you will profane the name of your God, I am yod heh vav -Hey. When stated about the, when cemented together with the fulfillment of a mitzvot, that's about God's faithfulness to pay back the good stuff. So God will say, I am yod heh vav -Hey, and he'll cement it to, like, I'm going to punish. And he's saying, I'm, fa I'm going to do this. I'm faithful to do it. That's my name, yod heh vav -Hey. Me, like, fulfilling the promise, that's what yod heh vav -Hey means. So Rashi is so smart. I could not figure this out in a million years. That it's there with good stuff, and it's there with bad stuff. I am yod heh vav -Hey. It means faithful to give a reward. So now it's that. But with my name yod heh vav -Hey, I didn't become known to them. So what do you think that means? They didn't understand it. No, not they didn't understand it, but that's a good guess. That's what I thought. That's exactly what I thought. He didn't fulfill it. It was a come later. So how could he be yod heh vav -Hey? How could he like manifest that faithfulness in answering the thing he promised? It wasn't coming for another 400 and some years, right? He said to Abraham, your children are going to be in bondage for 400 years. In other words, you're going to have to wait 400 and some years for me to fulfill this thing. I can't be yod heh I can't be yod heh vav -Hey to you. I can't be. Nor could I be to Isaac. Nor could I be to Jacob, which is exactly what he says here. He says... My name, yod heh vav -Hey, I didn't become known to them. Lo no, no da'ati, I did not become known. That is, I was not recognized by them with my attribute of keeping faith. That's what yod heh vav -Hey is all about. 
fulfilling the thing that he said he's going to do. This is why my name is called yod heh vav -Hey, faithful to verify my words. Because I made promises to them, but I did not fulfill while they were alive. He's so smart. I couldn't figure this out. And I went over and over and over this passage. I've been asking God this for, I don't know, maybe 10 years. I don't understand. How can you can say you didn't show yourself as yod heh vav -Hey when it clearly is in the text so many times, dozens of times. Here's the answer. yod heh vav -Hey is about faithfulness. It's that simple. He couldn't be yod heh vav -Hey to them. He hadn't fulfilled the promise. All right, does that make sense? Because yes. it makes sense to me. Hope it makes sense to you. So now we come to this really, really tough one. This is hard for Jews. I don't know if it's hard for Christians or Gentiles. I, I just don't know. Because for Jews, that is the one thing you do not ever, ever, ever do is say the name of God, write the name of God. Never. Never. You can, you can cuss up a storm saying GD all day long, but if you say the name of God, that's, I'm going to show you where that comes from. That's really bad. Leviticus 24 says this, the son of an Israelite woman spoke the name. Now they call it the ineffable name, which <laughs> don't think F, don't think letter F. The ineffable name, which means you can't get rid of it. You can't scratch it out. I know what you're thinking. The ineffable name. So some guy pronounces it. He says it. Oh my God. He needs to die because he spoke the name. Now look at what the rabbis insert into the passage so we can understand it. The tetragrammaton, that means four letters, the tetragrammaton that he heard at Sinai. This is what's so amazing. All of Israel at the revelation of God at Mount Sinai not just saw God, but we heard the name of God. We heard it. We all heard it. We all heard whatever that name is. Now this is very early. This is Leviticus. This is a guy who's alive at Mount Sinai and he heard God say his name and he said the name. So why is he being stoned? He's just saying what he heard. So the rabbis explain it. Verse 16 it says, you know, like the end of the, the story. I'm sorry, we need to finish reading that. What he heard at Sinai, and he blasphemed. Now this is the word nakav, and it means to pierce, to puncture, to perforate, or to attack. He did that to God. He basically made war on God. yod heh vav -Hey, I'm coming for you. And he used yod heh vav -Hey, whatever that pronunciation is, he used it to curse God, to, to, to make war on him. That's the bad part. It's not that he said the name. It's that he used it to, 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 to make war on God. And they brought him to Moshe. Verse 16, the one who pierces or attacks the name of the Lord, the one who pierces, Nakav, the one who pierces or attacks the name of the Lord. This is what God said in Moshe. The one who pierces or attacks the name of the Lord shall be put to death. Not who uses the name, who attacks the name. Uh-oh. That's what we've done for 2,000 years. We've attacked the name. We've pierced it. We've said, shh, shh, don't say it. Don't say it. Don't write it. Don't say it. Don't say it around anybody else. I'm, when I say we, I mean the Jews. This is what we've done. This is what we're guilty of. We have made war on God's name. So that we tell everybody, don't say that, don't read that, don't, don't write that, whatever you do. All the congregation shall stone him, proselyte and born Jew, doesn't matter. If he attacks, pierces, blasphemes, I hate that word blasphemy, I hate it. It doesn't mean anything. I, I like the word nakav. If he nakavs the name, if he pierces, makes war, pierces the name, he shall die. Now, here's where the trouble came in. The trouble came in 
about, it's pretty early, about the year uh, 140, right around the year 140, the Romans told the Jews, you may not say the name of God. Not Jews, the Romans said, you may not say the name of God. Meanwhile, there's Messianic Jews spreading like fire. There's also Gentiles coming in, and that's causing a problem. Because you can see this in the book of Acts, that there were all these, it calls them Jewish exorcists, that would go around and pray for people and drive out demons by the name. Hashem. Hashem, the name. And so the Romans and the sages said, we need to shut this down. Because the Messianic Jews are using the name, along with the name of Yeshua. We can't have that. And the Jews are using the name to do miracles with. And we cannot have this. It's going to destroy us as a people. The Romans are going to come in and wipe us out. That's exactly what happened. So because of that problem, they said, no more. Let's silence it. Let's stop it. Let's put a stop to it. Now, I, don't believe me. You need to do the research on your own and find out that this is exactly what happened. And it is written in many, many, many sources that this happened. So by the time you come to the Mishnah, codified in the second century, Mishnah teaches, Abba Shaul says, also among those who have no share in the world to come, going to hell, those who pronounce the ineffable name of God, as it is written with its letters. That's where it started. This is where it started. Nobody's to say that name. Nobody's to write that name. Shh. Keep it silent. No, no, this is Abba Shaul. Abba Shaul, yeah, there's a lot of uh, rabbis in the, in the Talmud and the Mishnah named Abba because that's not their name. That's what they were called, Daddy, Father. This one's Father Shaul. So uh, the one who pronounces the ineffable name goes to hell. That's big. But notice that it says, as it is written with its letters, and that's the key. It is taught in a baraita. Right after that, it says, okay, okay, now hold on. In a baraita, that means an, ex, uh, uh, an additional teaching, it says this. This is referring to the one who pronounces the name in the outlying areas outside the temple in non Hebrew language and for no particular purpose. So as soon as Rabbi Shaul says, we need to shut this down. All the other rabbis in their wisdom say, but you know what, there's a baraita. There's an additional teaching that says, there's some qualifications to that. It's not that cut and dry. It's got to be like outside the temple in a non-Hebrew language for no particular purpose. Now, in Talmud, also in the Talmud, that was in Talmud Sanhedrin, now in the Talmud Avodazara, later on, it says, Abba Shaul says, we know what he says, he who pronounces the ineffable name, etc. Then the Gemara says, it answers, Rabbi Hanina ben Taradion. And I'm not going to tell the whole story about this guy. He was killed by the Romans for saying the name. Not by Jews, by Romans for saying the name. They say, but you know what? Hanina ben Taradion, he did it. He spoke the name with all of its letters to teach himself so he could know God. As it is taught in Abareta with regard to the prohibition against sorcery. Now I'm telling you, there were, quote, Jewish, what are they called? Ex exorcists who went around driving out demons in the name of Yehovah. And they had to shut that down. Also, there was sorcery being done, calling on Yahweh, Yahava, Yohiva, 
Yoeva, and many other pronunciations of the name. Just like today. Yes, Yehuva Havua, exactly. Just like today. But they would do, do it for sorcery purposes. And they say, but you know what? Um, remember that in, in regard to the prohibition against sorcery, it says, you shall not learn to do. To do. Deuteronomy 18. This means you can learn in order to understand and to teach. You want to know the name of God? You want to say the name of God? Learn it. Learn it. So you can know it and you can teach it. In other words, certain prohibitions, they don't apply when one's acting to acquire knowledge of the subject. So there's always a qualification, but the qualifications dissolved, absolutely dissolved. And here it is. I never knew this till yesterday. Never knew this Hebrew till yesterday. Because nobody ever taught me the names of the vowels. The vowels are the key. I'm talking to you about, about that more. Now this gentleman, Nehemiah Gordon, is the one whose life purpose it is to get everybody in the world to understand the name of God. He has done a scholarly, scholarly uh, work that is just unbelievable. It's just unbelievable how many texts he's looked at and the work that he's put into it for years, yep, it's just unreal. And he has every single word out of his mouth documented by multiple, multiple hundreds of sources. Or else he doesn't say it. Just like Joe Good. Joe Good doesn't open his mouth until he has hundreds of sources. I'd like to think that I do the same thing that I will not say anything unless I can prove it and I have hundreds of sources to prove it or at least dozens that's what I'm after so he has an MA he's Jewish he has an MA in Hebrew University in Biblical Studies he has a BA from the same Hebrew University in Archaeology and he's he was a translator on the Dead Sea Scrolls this guy knows Hebrew backwards and forwards he's no slough it's not like going on the internet and seeing somebody who just, you know, in Hebrew roots, who just doesn't even know Hebrew, doesn't even know like uh, second grade Hebrew. This is why I don't go on the internet much anymore to look at things about Judaism. Because Hebrew roots has taken it over and they say things they don't know what they're talking about. 90% of it, they don't know what they're talking about. This guy has done research like you cannot believe. In this video called, Why Would I Ever Stop? He, he, he lays this out as clearly as you can imagine. And in this video, in 2001, on 9-11, on 9-11, as he got the message about what happened at 9-11, he found his very first written, Hebrew written document, ancient document, with the name of God written out fully as the towers were falling. That was in 2001 and he found two Hebrew manuscripts that year with the full vowelization and the vowels again are the big deal. That's what makes this work. That's how we know that we know the name of God. Not because of the letters, because of the vowels. So that was in 2001. By 2016, how many years later is that? 15 years later, he found the third, fourth, and then the fifth Hebrew manuscript. It took him 15 years to go from two to the third. So here's what he found. That there's three Hebrew letters in the name of God. How could he find that unless it was written? Nobody, nobody writes out the vowels. Not in any Torah scroll anywhere, not in any Bible printed or produced anywhere in Hebrew can you find the vowels under and over the name of God. We were told, don't do that. But he found them. Here's what he found. He found that there's three vowels. Shva, Cholam, Kamatz. Say Shva. 
Cholam, Kamatz. Shva, I thought was silent. If I thought it was silent. My whole life I thought Shva was silent. Like, like the word Shwa. Like if you look in a dictionary and, and I can't think of a word with Shwa. Uh, I can't think of one. But Shwa is just uh. It's just a uh. You know, like a stop. There's no sound to it really. Well, that's what I thought. So I would pronounce that Yehova. The Cholam is an O sound. A dot above the letter is an O sound. An A, ah, Kamatz, is an A ah sound. Okay, so I'm like, where, where did he see that? How does he know that the names, the letters, the, the, I'm sorry, the vowels in God's name are Shva, Cholam, Kamatz? You, you're going to learn today. You're going to see. So I always thought it was A, uh, Y. Yeah. It's not, I went on a simple B'nai Mitzvah website, a simple site that talks about, uh, you know, Hebrew for kids. And it says, if the Shva is under the first letter, it's an E eh sound. I never knew this till yesterday. I'm 62 years old. This is mind blowing to me because there's all these names in the Bible that are written like this. Yod on top and a shva underneath. And guess how they're written? Yeah. yeah. Shua. Yeah. Hoa has. Yeah. Who? Hundreds of them. So it's yeah. Ho. Va. Okay, he's found one. Then he found a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth. That's pretty compelling evidence. You know why? Nobody's ever looked in the Jewish sources. Ever. In 2,000 years. They quote every source in the world. Except Jewish sources. Don't look at the Jewish sources, yeah. So what he did was he asked, is it true that Jews don't know how to pronounce the name? Is that true? He just asked himself. And he came to the, I'm oh, sorry, then he found a rabbi that said, it's Yehovah. What? An ancient rabbi, like from medieval, ancient rabbi saying, it's Yehovah. And that rabbi explained the name with the vowels. So if you know the vowels, you know how to pronounce it. It's that simple. And he's like, what? So he came to the conclusion that no one has ever searched the Jewish sources. Because he got a thousand dollar database from, from, I can't remember which university it is in Tel Aviv. I don't think it's Hebrew U, but I might be wrong. 10, sorry, 100,000 Jewish documents on this. Basically all the Jewish writing that's out there. All the Jewish sources that are out there. Cost him a thousand dollars. And he's like, no. Nah, Certainly not going to find anything because Jews don't say the name of God and they certainly don't write it. 30 seconds he finds one and this is what he found. The rabbi that says it's Yehovah tells him, tells him nobody ever looked. Number one. Number two, it wasn't available. This wasn't available. There was no database in 1742, right? So there's this explosion of knowledge now that makes it possible for us to recover this amazing, amazing thing that God's name is Yehovah. Then he found 10 rabbis, 10 rabbis that said it's pronounced Yehovah. And he's like, what? what is going on here? Why don't we know this? And then by 2017, he'd found 90 manuscripts. Look at the jump in time. From 2001 to 2016, 15 years, took him to find four, or five rather. And then, two years later, he's up to 90. Now, when I say this is a lot of manuscripts, these are Jewish ancient documents with the name Yehovah written. That's huge. 
You want one, two, three, four sources to prove what you believe? Yeah, he's got over a hundred. With the full validation. Now look at this. Then Nehemiah has examined four of the six codexes. Now the codex, this is a big deal. There's only six codexes of the Bible. That means the whole Bible written in Hebrew, the whole Tanakh, written in Hebrew with the vowelization. There's only six of them in the whole world. The biggest one, the Aleppo Codex, is the most famous, and it was kept in a washing machine for, <laughs> for 100 years. And they, they brought it out, and they translated it, and they took pictures of it, and you can find it online. You can actually see the Aleppo Codex now because of this explosion in technology. Well, the Aleppo Codex has, which I will show you, seven instances of Yehovah. Seven instances. Then he found 16 rabbis by 2017 who talk explicitly about the fact that the vowels of the name are Sheva Cholam Kamatz. You can't pronounce it any other way. You cannot pronounce it Adonai. Because it doesn't say Adonai with Sheva, Cholam, Kamatz. Then he found 19 medieval rabbis who wrote out the name fully. And this is the thing that freaked me out. I, I thought no, no Jew ever wrote this. Well, he found 19 of them by 2017. Now, to date, he has found over 2,400 Hebrew manuscripts found with the full vowelization. He produced this when he got, you know, super excited in 2017 because they'd found a thousand. And there's an amazing couple, you know, he makes phone calls to the guys who are looking for these things out in the world. And it's an amazing uh, thing to listen to that they found these. Cholam, I'm sorry, Sheva, Cholam, Kamatz. Sheva, Cholam, Kamatz. Sheva, Cholam, Kamatz. All of them. And this is just a tiny sampling. And they all say the same thing. These are all from different documents, every one of them. So not only is it written once, it's written, do you know how many times it says Yehovah in the Tanakh? Anybody know? Very good, 6,927. Wow. 6,800, sorry. 6,827. It's amazing. So not only is this written here in this document, it's written everywhere in this document. Usually, not always, but usually. I'm just blown away. Shva Cholam Kamatz. This is from that website I told you about that I went to, and it says this. See the shva underneath the bed? See the shva? Yep. This is straight out of that website. It says, the second e vowel is two vertical dots. This vowel, shva, is more complicated. If you see two vertical dots underneath the first letter of the Hebrew word, the vowel is, vocalized, is vocal shva and makes an e sound. Never knew that till yesterday. Never knew that. I'm foolish. It makes an S sound. There's nothing more to it. It's that simple. I didn't add any words here. This is straight off the website. This is from a Jewish website who doesn't care about what the world believes the Hebrew is. However, if you find the two vertical dots under any other letter in the word, those two vertical dots act as a silent schwa, a stop sign. That's what I thought. I thought all, it was always a stop sign. This is from b'neimitzvahacademy.com. You can look it up yourself. So, oh man. this morning we were watching a video of Nehemiah Gordon where he tells the story of how he found the rabbis and what they said that the vowels for God's name are Shva Cholam Kamatz. It is unbelievable the story he tells. Here's the crux of it. He's looking, he doesn't know what he's going to find, and he finds these rabbis that say, you know, we don't say it and don't tell anybody else, 
But the vowels are shva cholam kamaz. Don't tell anybody. And then he finds a rabbi who says it right out. And then he says, hide this letter. Don't let anybody see it. Because it could fall into the wrong hands, somebody who's not holy. And they could pronounce the name. Oh, we can't have that. It's his 11th great-grandfather who did it. Which is why he feels such an amazing burning passion inside of him to restore this. Because his ancestor hid it. So we're watching this on Eileen goes, I wonder if your family did that with pictures. Basically, that's what she said. Maybe that's why you feel such a pull, a drive every day of your life to pictures. Maybe somebody in my family was like the master of anti-pictures. I don't know. Who knows? But it, it, the story is amazing to hear Nehemiah Gordon tell this story. So this is the Aleppo Codex, the most ancient full Tanakh manuscript. The Aleppo Codex. It was written in Tiberius about the year 920 to 930, endorsed by Maimonides, by Rambam. All other texts are checked against it. Do you understand what a big deal that is? That's the standard. That's the, the plumb line. You measure up to that, you're cool. You don't, bury it. And I really, literally mean that. You know, you've ever heard of the word Geniza? The, the, the Cairo Geniza, you ever heard that? A Geniza is, uh, there's one on Masada too. A Geniza is the, the trash dump for Torah scrolls and other Jewish writings. If it's defiled, if it's not full, if there's something wrong with the Torah scroll, you bury it in the Geniza. It's like, it's like putting it in the attic. And there are treasures in these Genizas. Well, guess what? The Aleppo Codex was in a Geniza. Yeah. It was hidden, yes. Yes, at a Geniza they actually have a service to bury a Torah scroll. That's correct. Nothing. It had the name of God written in it. Yes. It has the name of God written in it. With the full vowelization. We cannot have this. Yes. Uh, Syria, the, it was there for many, many, many generations. And then there was a huge war. And they killed all the Jews. And they burned the synagogues. And that's when it went to Israel. So, the Aleppo Codex, endorsed by Maimonides, it's, it used to be the fullest codex, but it got, some of it got burned up. So it's not the biggest one anymore. But what is left of it, they have found seven instances of Jehovah written fully. All others, all the other writing in the Aleppo Codex says Yehovah. So what's it missing? What's it missing if it says Yehva? Yes, it's missing the O sound. The, 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 what's it called? The Cholam. Very good, Ben. Good class participation. So here's one. Here's the Shva. There's no Cholam. And this is in a passage that it does have a Cholam. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, it's kind of messed up there. But... Uh, Right there in the same passage is one with the whole line and one without. Only seven in the whole codex. So, 1 Samuel 15, 1. Samuel said to Shaul, I am the one Yehovah sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. Therefore, listen to the word of Yehovah. No hola. 1 Kings 8, 11. Kohanim could not stand uh, to serve before the cloud for the glory of Yehovah filled the house of Yehovah. Same thing here. This has the Cholam. Barely. Barely. And this does not have a Cholam. 2 Kings 20. Yeshayahu said, Here is the sign for, for you from Yehovah. You can see the Cholam. This one's clear. That's a nice clear Cholam, right? Yeah. Quick, quick. Yes. Where, where you see it? 
No, the cholam is always above. That's what I mean. It's above, but not below. Where we're at. Oh, you're speaking in pictures. That's beautiful. Let me get that on the teaching. Very good, Joe. So it's above, not below, not where we're at, below. It's above, in heaven. That's why it's hidden. Right? Beautiful. You're a smart guy. And all the letters hang from the line. All the letters hang from the line. From heaven, that is correct. So here, it has the cholam here, and in the same passage, another one that doesn't have the cholam. Here is a sign for you from Yehovah, that Yehovah, Yehovah, will do what he said. Do you want the shadow to go ten steps? Isaiah 30, hoi, rebellious children, says Yehovah. They make counsels, but not of me. They make alliances, but not of my spirit, to pile sin upon sin. You can see the cholam real clearly in this one. Now the two dots above it, you can see it here too. That's a cantillation mark. You can see all those weird symbols, like this one, all over the place. That one, that one, that one. Those are cantillation marks, not vowels. Ezekiel 3.12, a spirit lifted me up. I heard behind me a very loud voice, blessed be the glory of Yehovah from his place. I love this one. I love this verse, Ezekiel 3.12. Yehovah. You can see the Holam real clearly. Ezekiel 28, 20. And the word of Yehovah, this does not have the Holam, came to me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Sidon. Prophesy against her and say, This is what Adonai, Adonai. Now it has Adonai, Yehovah. Adonai, Yehovah. A. Do, this has a cholam. Nai, yeah. Yod, He, Vav, He, there's the cholam. Yeah. Adonai, Yehovah. They are totally different words. We didn't know this. We were told our whole life, it's Adonai, Adonai, Adonai. Say Adonai. So all of our prayers say Adonai, not Yehovah. Well, here it's totally separate from Adonai. Psalm 26, my feet are planted on level ground in the assemblies, I will bless Yehovah. And you can see the holam here. Shva, big. Holam, pretty good. And the kamats, nice and clear. Now there's another video. He's got a lot of videos. This one is called, Why It's Yeho Yehovah, But Hallelujah. Yeah and Yah. Yeah and yeah. And this is where all the problems come in. With people who don't know Hebrew. And they end up with Yahshua and Yahoshua. Sorry. Yah, Yaheshua and Yahashua and Yashahua and all those other variations. It's simple uh, misunderstanding of Hebrew. Now this is a trip. Rabbi David Luzato, in 1835, told Jacinius, who I love, I love Jacinius, because that's where I learned Hebrew. And guess what I found out? He is the, the number one Hebrew grammarian in the whole world. He was a Christian, which I knew, and he made a lot of mistakes. I didn't know that. I found some which made me go, this guy's Hebrew is, there's something wrong here. Rabbi David Luzato went to Jacinius, uh, um, uh, Rabbi, I mean, uh, Nehemiah Gordon calls him Gazinius. I don't know which is the proper way to say it. I say Jacinius. Gazinius is how he pronounces it, because he was German. 1835 told Jacinius the Hebrew laws Rabbi David Luzato went to Jacinius, a Christian, and told him the Hebrew laws and why it was always Yehovah. And Jacinius did not listen. And so it served to make another problem that now all the believers have the wrong name. 
because he was a Christian. He's the greatest grammarian in the whole world, still to this day. Now, there's uh, in this video, he has, see that big list of names? Yehoahaz, Yehoahaz, Yehoash, Yehozadak, right? No, Yehozabad, Yehochanan, Yehoyada, Yehoyada, Yehoyakim, Yehoyakim, Yehoyadav, Yehonatan, Yehoadan, Yehoadon, Yehotzadak, Yehoram, Yehosheba, Yehoshabat, Yehoshua, that's the interchangeable name with Yeshua, Yeshua, Yehoshua, and Yehoshaphat, and then Yehovah. If there's a Shva underneath the first letter, it's what sound? Yeah. Eh. I didn't know this. So I always wondered, why is it always yeah, 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 yeah? in all these names. Why isn't it Yeh, Yehoshua? Here's the answer. There's the answer. Shva at the beginning, always an F. Beginning the word, it is always Yeh, which is like Yah at the end of the word. Hallelujah. Why isn't it Hallelujah? Because it's not at the beginning of the word. It's that simple. Hallelujah. The first syllable is not emphasized, so it's a kamatz, ah. Second syllable is emphasized, it's a shva. Pretty simple. Here's a couple examples. Gadol. See the kamatz? Gadol. Do you see the kamatz at the beginning? But in Hebrew, it's gedolim. So this would be what? Gedolim. Gedolim. But Gadol singular, Gedolim plural. Katan singular, Ketan, Ketanim plural. I put apostrophes. Should that be an apostrophe? No. No, it should be an E. Gedolim, Ketanim. You know why it's apostrophe? Because I wrote this on the slide before, the day before I found out about the, about the uh, E being in the first shva, and I never went back and changed it. That's my bad. Sorry about that. So do we know which vowel is emphasized? Yes. Yehovah or Yehovah or Yehovah. Yes, because it's in the first, the shva is in the first. First syllable is not emphasized, so it's a kamatz. So is the first syllable emphasized? If the first syllable is not emphasized, it's a kamatz, ah. So, is Yehovah emphasized with the E? Yes. Yes. Okay. Second syllable emphasized is a shva. Yehovah. Okay, that's why it's not Yaho. That's why it's not Yahshua. It's not Yahshua. This is why it's Yeshua, not Yahshua. Most don't read Hebrew. We know that. So, they don't know the kibbutz vowel. Now this is important. That's called kibbutz. Say kibbutz. And it's, it's not kibbutz, it's kibbutz. Like book, book. And it makes that sound. B oh, oh, like book. Kibbutz. Look at the name Yehoshua. Yehoshua. The interchangeable name with Yeshua. That's the kibbutz. But Gentiles don't know that. And so they just read the vowel, I'm sorry, the, 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 the letters, which says Yehusha. Because they don't know that it's got the O on top, making it Yehosha, not Yehusha. And they don't know what a kamatz is. They don't know, I mean, uh, they don't know what a kibbutz is with the O uh sound. And so they read that as Yeh, Yehusha. And so they say the name of Yeshua is not Yeshua, it's Yehusha. And I've seen this all over the internet. This is where it comes from. Because they don't know the kibbutz vowel. They say Yehushua, not, I'm sorry, it is Yehoshua, not Yehusha. 
Yehoshua and Yeshua are inter interchangeable names. We've been through this before. Yeh is actually, what does it mean? What is Yeh? Yah. Yeah. Yeah. It's Yah. Yeh is Yah. Ho means he. And Shua means salvation. Yah, he is salvation. That's Yehoshua. And the, and, the, and the short form of that, like Michael and Mike, the short form is Yeshua. That's a contraction. It's not a name. It's like ain't or can't or don't. It's a contraction. It's taking this and smushing it together and making it shorter. It still means the same thing. Yeah is the Yah, and Shua is, is salvation. That's why it's an interchangeable name. Ezra 3, 2, this proves it. Ezra 3, 2 and Zechariah 3. Ezra was at the same time as Zechariah. Who were the two prophets? Anybody know who the two prophets were that prophesied to Ezra and Nehemiah to rebuild the temple? And Zerubbabel? You don't remember? Um, Haggai and Zechariah. So Zechariah was at the same time as Ezra. So whatever guy they're talking about is the same guy. Like if you say the king, the king in Ezra is the king in Zechariah. If you say the high priest, the high priest in Ezra is the high priest in Zechariah. Same guy. Ezra 3, when the seventh month came, the people gathered together as one man to Jerusalem. Then Yeshua ben Yotzadak. Yesh, and it says in, in English, Jeshua with a J. We know there's no J in Hebrew, right? So what is it? Yeshua. Then Yeshua ben Yotzadak, which is short for Yehotzadak, to whom, which means to whom Yah is righteous, and his brothers the Kohanim, and Zerubbabel ben Shealtiel and his brothers rose up and built the altar. What's the high priest's name? What's the high priest's name? Okay. Yeshua. The high priest's name is Yeshua. Now, contemporary to him, Zechariah, he talks to Yeho Yeshua. And he says, now listen, Yehoshua. Calls him by his full name. Same guy. So we have undisputable proof that the name of Yehoshua, full, if you shorten it, it is not Yahshua. It's Yeshua. You can see it in the Hebrew, in all Bibles, in Ezra. Now listen, Yehoshua, Kohen Gadol, you and your friends who are sitting in front of you, you're a picture. And he tells them this amazing passage about the branch, about the Messiah. Same guy. Now we come to a passage that was in the Torah portion last week. Exodus 3.14. But before we look at this, this is what God says in this passage. I'm sorry. Yeah, in this passage, Exodus 3.14. This is what God says. Moses says, they're not going to listen to me. I mean, I mean, first of all, they're not going to listen to me because, you know, things are bad. And second of all, you, who am I supposed to tell him is talking to me about this? Because you haven't told me your name. Because he hasn't told him his name. This is Moses. Right? They've been in bondage 210 years. Not 400. They've been in bondage 210 years. Then there was another couple hundred years before that. With, Ab with Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes. Which equals 400 years. During these 210 years of bondage, was Moses learning Judaism? In Egypt, was he learning Judaism? No, he was learning the ways of Egypt. It says in Acts chapter 7, by the way, that he learned all the ways of Egypt. It doesn't say he learned the ways of God. It says he learned the ways of Egypt. All their gods. A list is a mile long of all the gods of Egypt. He knew those names. But he didn't know the name Yehovah. Why? Because God never made the name Yehovah known in its fulfillment to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob or to the 12 tribes. And then God says, I'm not going to be really Yehovah 
until I fulfill it. And he ain't fulfilled it yet. So Moses doesn't know this. He doesn't know the name of God. And he's like, okay, so God, who do I say is telling me this stuff to bring the Jews out? And he says, he who was, I am. The way it's translated in English is really hard. It's really bad. It says, I am that I am. It doesn't say that. It says in Hebrew, Hayah, Hove, Yihye. Hayah, Hove, Yihye. Which is just the verb to be. You want to know who's sending you? To be. The, the it, the what is. And what's going to be and what was. That's who's sending you. He says that. Haya, look what's here. Can you read that? Yeah, ah. Hove, can you read that? The, the yellow part, can you read that? Ho. And then, ye ye, look at the first letter. Yeah. Yod, hey, vav, hey. Now I know this is backwards, but who cares? What he did was he took the verb to be in its different forms, squashed it together, and said, there, there's four letters, that's my name. But when he said it fully, this is what he said. Moshe said to God, look, I'm going to go to the sons of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers. And they're going to say, okay, what's his name? The God of your fathers sent me to you. Now they're going to say to me, what's his name? What, should I, what am I supposed to tell them? I don't know if that freaks you out, but that freaked me out. That he says, I don't know your name. I don't know what to tell him. And God said to Moshe, Ehiye asher ehiye. Ehiye asher ehiye. I will be what I will be. In other places he says, he who was, he who is, he who will be. But here he just says, I am who I'm going to be. Something like that which has these letters, yod hey vav hey, and it gets squashed together to ye ho va. This is in a disastrous misunderstanding of the name Yehovah. He does a much, much, much better uh, explanation, job of explaining it than I did, but this is where you can find this. But the verse is what freaks me out, that Moshe says, I don't know your name. And neither does anybody else here. And so God tells him his name. But he doesn't say Yehovah, does he? He doesn't. He says, Ehiye, Asher, Ehiye. Exodus 3.15, you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am, Ehiye, has sent me to you. So that's what he says. He says, okay, here's who I am. Ehiye, Asher, Ehiye. So here's what you say to the Jews. Ehiye sent me, to be. That's who sent me, the verb to be. This is what you shall say to B'nai Israel. And now he says, look. Now he says, Yehovah. So he says, tell him Ehiye sent you. Now, here's what you say. Yehovah. And then he says his name. So I want you to see that he says both. He says it full, and then he squashes it together into Yehovah. Yehovah, and it is Yehovah, God of your fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> That's what happened. To remember generation to generation. He says just the opposite. Tell everybody. Don't forget. And so the Jews go, shh, don't say it. Forget. Forget. This is a huge evil. And it needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. That's what people are afraid of. They're afraid to be stoned and for God to hurt us if we say his name. Now look at this. God said, what, what, who did he say sent Moshe? Ehiye. I am. 
Yes? yes. Tell them. Echie sent you. Mark 14, 61 says, Again the high priest was questioning him and said to him, Are you the Mashiach, son of the Baruch I mean, even today, like uh, Rabbi Anava, one of my favorites, he, he doesn't say Kahad, he doesn't say Elohim. He says Hash, Hashem Baruch The name, blessed be he. Okay, that's what he's saying here. Are you the Mashiach who's the son of the Baruch the blessed one? And Yeshua said, Echie. That's what he said, Echie. And you're going to see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. That was his answer, Echie. And he's saying this to the Sanhedrin, by the way, to the Kohen Gadol, who carries yod heh vav -He, Yehovah, on his forehead on a golden plate. And Yehovah written by the letters that shine on the Choshen, the breastpiece. This is Mr. Yehovah that he's saying this to. You want to know who I am? I'm Echie. Remember? And this is Yeshua saying it about himself. And then, when they're coming to take him in the Garden of Gatshemen, the Garden of Gethsemane, he does the same thing, only this time it knocks everybody down. John 14, 18, sorry. Four through six. Yeshua, therefore, knowing everything that was coming on him, came out in the open and said to them, Who are you looking for? So, in other words, he's instigating, saying, Hey, listen, guys, who are you looking for? He doesn't have to do this. He should be hiding in the corner saying, You know, if I have to go, oh Lord, I shall go. You know what I mean? It's like he, he, most people picture him like scared and meek and whatever. No, he's instigating telling the Romans, Hey guys, guys, who are you looking for? High priest with your, with your guys, who are you looking for? So they can say who they're looking for. They said, Yeshua HaNotsri. Yeshua, the, Nazar, the Nazarene, or the one from Nazareth. Yeshua Hanotsri, and he said to him, Echie! Now, it kind of drifts off. You can't really see it real clear here, but it's amazing. Judah also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. I wish that wasn't there. I wish the next phrase came next, but it doesn't. When he said to them, Echie, they were thrown back and fell to the ground. You ever see that? When he said, Echie, they were thrown back and fell to the ground. Why doesn't he say, I'm Yehovah? Because he is not. He's the Son. The Father is Yehovah. The Son is another manifestation of God, Echie. The verb to be. While he was on earth, he was not God. But he's Echie. I am. So, the rest is going to have to be up to you. I think I've done, a, you know, I give myself a B minus on the presentation <laughs> of trying to get this across. But, uh, guys, you've got to see the videos by Nehemiah Gordon. They're, they're just, they're just mind-blowing, mind-blowingly clear about all the evidence that my people have hidden. And I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Gentiles. You who are Gentile, I'm so sorry that my people hid from you the name of God. Hid from you, Yehovah, the name of our Father. Let's pray. Yehovah, our King, Yehovah, our Father, Avinu Malkenu. I thank you for revealing all the things you're re revealing now that you're bringing out from the dirt, bringing out from the dark, and you're revealing, you're bringing revelation to us to know you so we can know you. And I ask that your Ruach, your spirit, and your Torah would just shine on many, many, many teachers out there to see the simplicity of the pictures, to see the truth, 
of who Israel is and to see the amazing simplicity of your name, Yehovah, and that we shouldn't be afraid to say your name. There's no need to be afraid. In fact, you want us to say it. And I ask that you would show people all over the world that you want us to know you. And I ask that you'd open your arms in a big hug, especially to your people Israel, to show that you want to have relationship with us. And then there's all the Gentiles coming in to your people, that you want to give them a big hug and show them that you want to know them and you want them to know you. I thank you, Abba, that you are our king and we exalt your holy name. Amen. Let's stand for the Alenu. Alenu la shabayach la adon ha kol. Letet gedula la yotzer bereshit. Shalo asanu kogoye ha aratsot. Velo samanu kamish pachota adama. Shelo sam chel kenu kahem. Vegoralenu kakol hamonam. Let us adore the Lord of all, who in greatness created the world from of old, that he's not made us like the nations of the earth, not made us like the families of the land. He has not made our destiny like theirs, or cast our lot with all of them. V'ne'emar v'haya Adonai l'melech al kol ha'aretz b'yom ha'hu b'yom ha'hu yie Adonai echad u'shemo his name u'shemo. And it is said, Yehovah shall be king over all the earth. In that day, Yehovah shall be one, and his name one. Isn't that awesome? Va anachnu korim umishtachavim umodim. Lifne melech malachei hamalachim hakadosh baruchu. And we bend the knee and bow in worship and give thanks to the King of Kings, the Holy One. Blessed is He. We acknowledge before the King of Kings that there is none like Him. There is nothing but Him. As Torah says, know that Yehovah, He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Ein od milvado. There is nothing else but Him. Shabbat Shalom. Let's do Kiddush, please. <laughs>